We now have both verdicts in the Kristen Smart murder trial. And we just learned moments ago, Ruben Flores, the father, Paul Flores, has been found not guilty of accessory after the fact. His son, Paul Flores, was just found guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Um, apparently, he had some kind of monitoring, ankle monitoring device. Um, and that was taken off. He was discharged, allowed, a free man, free to go, 81 years old. Um, must be a difficult, difficult day for that man as his son was convicted of first degree premeditated murder and will be sentenced in December. On December 9th is my understanding. He faces 25 years to life in prison. Of course, um, there's a lot to happen between now and that December 9th date. There'll be a sentencing report about who this guy is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll keep monitoring that as well. Um, joining us with the breaking details, of course, is Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson. He joins me uh, here in the studio. Again, we had talked a lot about this case. I know. We thought it would be the opposite way, perhaps. Um, uh, maybe that there would be a guilty verdict because there was a little bit more sort of CSI type evidence mm -hmm. in Ruben's case. Right. Um, but it didn't. It was the opposite. He's found out. And that's too. why we thought it was going to be flipped, right? Right. Because there wasn't the CSI type evidence, if we're going to phrase it that way, for Paul that yes. we saw play out in court. It was just all of the witness accounts. And those are memories that are 26 years old at this yes. point. And then with the father, with Reuben, there was that shape of where a body could have been buried underneath the house. Okay. There was evidence of blood there. Inside his bedroom, next to his bed, was a piece of furniture where he had missing persons posters of Kristen Smart. He had other items, news articles of Kristen Smart. It's like, why would someone have that? And prosecutors had a picture of all of those items laid out on his bed, and they showed it to this jury, his jury, um, in closing arguments. Um, and they were saying these were his trophies because he knew what he did and he got away with it this long. Well, right now, he is not a convicted man. He is not facing up to three years anymore. Yeah. And with that ankle monitor, it was interesting because, you know, I would see him go in and out of the courthouse. He was out on bail and um, he would wave to the cameras and smile. It was actually his attorney that kind of kept on reminding the 81 year old, hey, you can't talk to them. You're under a gag order. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. this guy didn't have a care in the world. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that gag order you spoke of, it was modified by the judge. Our counsel can now comment on the case and the evidence, et cetera. So we're expecting some sort of uh, press conference to come up shortly. We'll, of course, bring that to you. We'll bring the information that comes from it. Of course, let me bring back in my guest uh, with me for this hour. It's criminal defense attorney April Prayer. Um, April, what about the decision by prosecutors to try these two together? Because there was always the prospect that it would be flipped, that in fact, they, there would be a not guilty verdict for Paul and a guilty verdict. So essentially the jury saying, we don't believe this guy committed this murder, but then the other jury finding that we believe Ruben helped his son cover up this murder. And we thought that would cause problems and bringing them together was a curious decision for me uh, by prosecutors. Your thoughts on that? I think prosecutors believed it would make their case stronger yeah. to show that the two were in cahoots, that dad, you know, felt bad for his son and he was helping him cover up this crime, that they were working together, that they had this wall of silence or this bond between them. And actually, it looks like at least on Ruben's behalf, it backfired and that he is now a free man. So I, I don't agree with the poster that you just had a poster up saying trophy room. I, I think that's a stretch. If you know that your son is a suspect in a murder and you know that he knew this young lady, it's not unusual that he would be keeping track and that he would be trying to help and that he would be collecting the posters and the clippings from newspapers. I don't think that's a, a, a showing of guilt. And it seems like the jury may have agreed with me. Yeah, and it's inconsistent with the idea that he would have gone through all this to hide this murder and then be so flamboyant about having trophies about this murder. Didn't make sense to me. You know, Chris Lambert is the guy who really revived this story. He's a podcaster. He did uh, In Your Own Backyard or Your Own Backyard, which really revived interest and then led to the uh, revival of this prosecution. I want to listen to something here. This was an interview done by our own Matt Johnson, where he talks about one of the reasons he believes um, that Paul was guilty and, in fact, the parents were in cahoots. Let's take a listen. The way that 
Paul and his entire family responded to the Smart family who were looking for their daughter. That there's never been a moment over the past 26 years where they said, look, we understand why you might suspect our son. Let's sit down and talk about this. Why don't you come over, ask questions, we'll be there to protect him, and we'll just let this be a forum until you feel better never had that. They, they responded very nasty to any request for a civil conversation about this, um, and they, they sort of dug their heels in. But before there was any publicity in the case, they keep bringing up the reason that they were so defensive was the amount of publicity. But before the publicity, they didn't want to talk. So that's the big piece to me that's like, why would people do that unless it's because they were hiding something? All right, I want to get both your response to that, but I'm going to begin with you, begin with you Matt Johnson, because you actually spoke to Chris Lambert, spent some time with him. Uh, your thoughts on some of his thoughts regarding the parents in this case? I felt like he was very close to, to the situation, to the case. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people might think that he was very slanted in mm -hmm. some of his reporting, and that's yeah. fine. You know, he's a podcaster, sure. Um, but he spent a lot of time with the Smart family, and a lot of people can't say that they have because they, they're very closed off at this point, mm -hmm. and they want justice, and they didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. All right, April, I want to get your response because my response to it was, um, and I, I'm a New Yorker, so I look at things a little differently. Um, if somebody's accusing my children of something, I don't want you anywhere near me. Um, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to sit down and try to work it out because... No one knows except those parents what those accusations are like and, and whether they're, um, we had heard testimony and, and there were reports of how they would drive around the house and constantly sit outside his house to wait to talk to him. I mean, those things strike me as a bit over the top and maybe would not make me want to talk. And, and so when someone who is investigating this case like a podcaster comes up with that as the reason why he thinks parents are involved, I have to, I have to question it a little bit. I think it's a very weak notion that because they wouldn't sit down and sing Kumbaya together and hold hands and talk about what happened, that therefore they must be hiding something. I think that's a, a, a myth, being silent. Remember, you have a, a, a right to be silent. They had no reason to engage with the other family. They could very well, very much sympathize with them and empathize with them and still not have to sit down and break bread with them or be in the same space with them. So I think that is more the idea of protective parenting, of trying to protect their son. You know, you got to remember, parents don't know what happened one way or the other. They don't know if he did or he didn't do it. They weren't present and they want to protect their child at all costs. So I totally understand them not wanting to sit down and have any conversations with the smart family and possibly make their situation much worse. Exactly. It's not something that I would have judged to be the reason why I think that they're involved or guilty somehow. Again, just to reset folks, uh, Paul Flores has been found guilty of first degree premeditated murder and the murder of Kristen Smart. His father, however, Ruben Flores, has been found not guilty of accessory after the fact. He's a free man. Walked out of court today, ankle monitor taken off, so bittersweet day for him. Um, let me turn back to Matt Johnson because I understand you're getting some word from Adrienne Luis, mm -hmm. who is our producer on the ground there. She is our field producer, uh, has been there and was in there for the verdict. Uh, new information. Tell us about She's it. She's been there from the beginning, and um, she just spoke with Harold Messick. Remember, they both had separate defense attorneys. Yes. This is defense attorney for Ruben Flores, found not guilty. And what he has shared with her is that he's very pleased, of course, um, and he believed all along that his client not guilty and absolutely innocent. He said that he loves our system, speaking about Ruben, um, justice system and disagrees with the verdict for Paul. Um, Adrian also spoke with the 81 year old who was found not guilty, the father, and she said, how are you feeling? He said one word to her. He said, I feel relief. And she asked him what you're gonna be doing later today and he said he didn't know, but He's mm -hmm. no longer being monitored by the court yeah. system with that ankle monitor. Hmm. Um, I wonder if he's going to be clipping articles tonight. Interesting. But, you know, relief. I mean, uh, if my son was just convicted of a crime that I am pretty sure he either didn't commit, why would relief be what I feel? It'd be some sort of bittersweet. That's a good point, because <laughs> uh, to your point, yes. um, the only time that we saw Susan Flores in the courtroom was during opening statements and closing arguments. Mm -hmm. And remember, um, the juries were only in there for their 
for their cases right, during for their that. Individual okay? cases. So Susan Flores sat with Ruben, um, and they held hands during closing arguments as um, mm. in the in the gallery. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, my understanding now is that we are being joined by Court TV field producer Adrienne Luis. She is joining me now live from Salinas, California. Uh, she actually joins us on the phone. Adrienne, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to me today. Um, yeah, my understanding is you were in the courtroom for the reading of these verdicts. First and foremost, uh, give us what the atmosphere was like uh, leading up to the reading of the verdict. Yes, sir. Um, there is, uh, you know, a lot of media present. We've been gathered here um, for several days now. Uh, it was very tense in that courtroom, very quiet. Um, you could hear uh, a pin drop. And uh, we were waiting for quite a bit for the jurors to arrive. Um, and initially, it was Paul's jurors who were led in. Uh, next to them or in the gallery are the family of um, the the smart family and you know they're very um, they're holding each other's arms very close together um, and in the uh, on the other side of the gallery is Ruben and his attorney Misik so he was not sitting up there with his son Paul and as the jury was read uh, for Paul Flores you could hear a huge sigh of relief coming from the Smart family. Uh, you could, I could see that um, Kristen's mom, her hands were visibly shaking. Uh, she was, you know, trying to grab at these tissues, and everyone was trying to comfort each other. Um, it seemed like they were very uh, happy with that verdict. And then when. Uh, it was quite a while before uh, Ruben's jury was assembled and then also led in. At this time, uh, there, were, like Paul was not present. He had already been led out of the courtroom. And so he took Paul's place out in the well. Um, the family, uh, you know, very quieted themselves. They weren't very loud to begin with. And then uh, when his verdict was read, not guilty as opposed to um, Paul's jury, uh, you know, I could see uh, Misik, you know, clap his hand on uh, Ruben's shoulder, and you know, he started peering over to the jury to see their reaction. I didn't really observe too much reaction from them. There um, was one woman who seemed to be kind of uh, restraining herself. She had, um, you know, this jury has been through a lot, almost pretty much three months um, of this trial. And so, you know, it could be emotional experience for them. Yeah, that, that, as you mentioned, this trial took three months and this family has been waiting for justice in this case since 1996. So I can't even imagine what the emotion would be like there. But on the flip side, my understanding is you did have an opportunity to speak with Ruben Flores and his attorney. Um, tell us about that interaction. Yes, um, a few of us were just sitting outside. Um, I uh, mainly just wanted clarification on the gag order, and he clarified to me that the parties um, uh, could speak about the evidence in the case. And, um, and so I asked him um, just if he could give us a few words on um, his reaction. And he, uh, you know, as we hear from many defense attorneys, you know, fully believe that their clients are not guilty and he agreed with that and um, you know he of course he was very pleased with the outcome uh, for Ruben uh, this not guilty verdict uh, and he, you know he added that he loves our system of justice um, but as for Paul he did mention that he disagrees with that verdict so then I turned my attention to Ruben and you know he, he I asked him how do you feel he goes relief he said he, you know, wasn't, he also, like uh, Mr. Misik, is not happy with uh, the verdict for his son. And so Ruben himself said there's a lot of stuff made up out there about his son, and there's a lot of stories out there. Um, but he didn't seem to uh, elaborate on this. He um, seemed a little in shock of uh, you know, what all had transpired. And I asked him what he will what he will do next, what he will do tonight. He said, I don't know. Mm. 
oftentimes they, they sleep for two or three days. I, I remember defendants, I mean, it was just the relief. And, and, and you know, the relief is real. I mean, it, this is a tense situation for everyone involved. Finally, Adrienne, uh, what is next for Paul? You said Paul was taken out of the well, of course, taken into custody. Um, what's next for him? Um, his sentencing uh, has been put out to uh, December 9th uh, to allow for travel and for everyone to appear. Um, he will not have bail, and um, we should be present for that. And you'll hear more once that happens. All right, fantastic. Adrian Luis, thank you so much.